Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here and welcome to the 51st episode of the RIT podcast. The next election in Quebec will officially get underway in less than two months and we'll know the results in less than three. So there's lots to talk about about this race. The polls are giving Francois Legault and the CEQ a big lead, but that doesn't mean they're automatically going to win this election. So joining me today to talk about that campaign is Philippe J. Fournier of 338Canada.com. Bonjour Philippe. Bonjour Philippe. Eric, it's always great to see you. Thanks for having me. Yes. Well, you know, it's always fun to chat uh, Quebec politics with you. Um, you know, you keep an eye on the numbers probably more than I do in Quebec. So uh, you're certainly the person to talk to. So I want to go through each of the parties, kind of set the table for each of them. Um, we'll start with the CAQ. So the polls have been giving Francois Legault and the CAQ a big lead. Uh, it's been consistent. They've had a lead pretty much in every poll that we've seen for the last few years yes. and across the province. So why are they in such a good position to win a majority government, assuming that they can keep these numbers steady? Well, that's well, that's a very wide general question. I like that. Uh, first, I'd like well, I would say first that even though uh, this opinion is not unanimous in Quebec, as well ago uh, in the polls, we see that many Quebecers, if not most Quebecers, are happy the way they handle COVID for the most part, and so. Uh, 2018 was a change election. François Legault has been surfing on that, that new, uh, new wave of the CEQ. And of course, he's facing a very divided and struggling opposition. So that helps, similar to Doug Ford in Ontario. Um, but for the most part, and I mean, in the first year of COVID, I mean, his numbers were astronomical. I mean, we have saw polls from Léger that 85% of Quebecers were satisfied with his handling of COVID, which is I mean, almost Soviet numbers, right? Without exaggerating, dude, those were crazy numbers. Now it's gone down a little bit. It's gone back back down to earth. But the last Leger that we saw uh, in June uh, had uh, satisfaction with the Legault government at 57%. And for an incumbent government, uh, three months for an election, that is really high. It's a really good number for the CEQ. And so even though there's they have their critics, they have been stumbling <laughs> in the last few weeks uh, but it's summer, so it's a good time to stumble when you're in politics. Uh, for the most part, the CEQ has taken up so much space on the political spectrum in Quebec because they're a right of center party, which has not cut taxes or has not done what other right of center parties do. So, I mean, conservatives, conservatives say the CEQ is a left wing party because they spent so much uh, since uh, in their first term. And they're Federalists, but also nationalists, and they welcome Bernard Drainville in their in their fold. And so they're, they're a big coalition that covers so much ground in Quebec politics that it leaves very little to the opposition party. So it's a, I mean, it's a long answer, I'm sorry, but it's it, it's, it's a, a wide range of um, the fact that the opposition is divided. It's in pieces right now. And Francois Legault has been able to sail through the, the, the storm of COVID uh, for the most part uh, on scale. Yeah. And when you're looking at, you know, you mentioned Ontario, uh, and Doug Ford, also a big spender. I don't think anybody calls him a left wing politician. Yeah. But also, you know, when you're just looking at the numbers, the CQ usually is somewhere around 40 percent or higher, uh, depending on right. the poll. But because they have usually 50, 55 percent support among francophones, uh, it, it, it makes their ability to win a majority government even more dramatic than the numbers might. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And for those who don't know, I mean, the, the non-francophone voters in Quebec are not entirely, but mostly located in the western and northern Montreal uh, ridings in Quebec, and maybe a bit of La Vallée de Poutaouais as well. But, you know, even if the Liberals won all the non-francophone voters, which they won't, but even if they did, that's still just 15 to 20 seats out of 125. And so the CAQ is leading, uh, has uh, in some polls, a majority of francophone voters in their fold. And so, you know, winning 80 to 90 seats is, I think, an easy task for them. Winning from where, somewhere to 90 to 100 may be uh, harder, but of course, the threshold for majority is 63. So um, it should be, unless they stumble really badly, it should be an easy majority for Francois Legault. Uh, in three months, but yeah. then again, I, I I will I will you know I will tell your readers I'm writing a, a column for L'Actualité magazine that explores the nightmare scenarios for each party, and the CAQ's nightmare scenario is very dramatic, but it's similar to you remember the 2014 campaign from the Parti Québécois and Pauline mm -hmm. Lavoie, where every day it was stumbling. It was just the worst campaign I have ever ever seen in my life, and of course they went from almost a majority. 
uh, in the polls to winning 30 seats and being uh, the official opposition. So you would need a bad campaign for the CEQ. I, it's unlikely to happen. I, I'm sorry, you were saying? Yeah, well, yeah, just going back to what I said about Ontario, it's the same kind of thing, right? We're going into that campaign expecting the PCs to win. And the thing that would have upset them would be a bad campaign from the PCs. They didn't have one. So it's the same situation with the CAQ. And yeah. just to go back to what we were saying about the Anglophone, Francophone vote, the elections in the 90s, the popular vote between the two parties, the Parti Québécois and the Liberals, was virtually tied in those elections. But the PQ was able to win big majority governments because they had the Francophone vote. So if the CAQ right. has that Francophone vote, uh, it gives them even a bigger cushion, right? If they're ahead in the polls by 15 points, uh, that means a big majority government because they could oh. probably still win if they're ahead by, if they're even behind. If they're even behind yeah. uh, the Liberals, for example, they'd probably be able to still win a majority government. We forget sometimes that Lucien Bouchard lost the popular vote in 98, not by much, of course, but he did lose the popular vote. And I think he won 76 seats. So absolutely, the CEQ. I mean, you go in through the map outside of Montreal, the, the 450. So the, the suburbs of Montreal, similar to the 905 in Ontario. Right now, there's only one seat. No, sorry, two seats that are projected not going to the, the CEQ out of, I think, 30. Right there. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a good cushion. Then you add Quebec City. Then you add the Saguenay and the regions. And, you know, every opposition party would have to overperform their expectations and their polls for the CEQ to be barely at the threshold for a majority. That's where we're at right now. Okay, so let's talk about the vulnerabilities of the CEQ. You mentioned right. if they had a bad campaign. So what are the vulnerabilities for the CEQ that could end up with them falling short of a majority government or even winning? <laughs> There were two polls, Eric, in June uh, about the sovereignty. I mean, sovereignty used to be polled monthly in Quebec. Yeah. Uh, now we don't do that much anymore because it's not on the table. Uh, and the two polls said pretty much the same thing. About a third of Quebecers would vote yes to a referendum. And so that's a lot in absolute terms. But in relative terms, it's really, I mean, it's not on the table because even a majority of CAQ voters would not follow along if François Legault were to go down that path. And I, I mean, a bunch of his cabinet ministers would not go along. So it's not on the table. But this is a recipe for the Parti Québécois. I mean, there's about 30% of Quebecers that would vote yes to referendum. But right now, the PQ is at 9% in voting intentions. So there's a huge disconnect here. If the Parti Québécois had a strong campaign uh, denouncing Ottawa and talking about independence and sounding perhaps like a broken record, it could they could go up because reasonably, the sovereignty is more popular than them. So if they latch onto this uh, issue, they could go up in the polls. I mean, they could antagonize a lot of people too, but they could go up in the, in the polls. For Quebec Solidaire, you know, I, they will bet a lot, uh, I think, on Gabriel Nadeau Dubois. We, we see him, it's his first election as a uh, parliamentary leader, as party leader. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see him go because he's a very talented speaker. Uh, he still antagonizes a lot of people, especially baby boomers who remember him uh, as a student uh, protest leader. But uh, they, I'm, I think they're going to bet a lot on him. And uh, I'm looking forward to see what he does in the debate because we think he's very talented. We'll see. Uh, the liberals. Well, the liberals have to go back <laughs> and hope that traditional voters who stayed home in 2018 come back this time around. They have to remind non-Francophone voters that, yeah, Bill 96 was a problem, uh, the language law uh, that, we, uh, that we did a back and forth on a bunch of uh, amendments that they proposed. That, that looked bad on the party, but we still, you know, if you don't vote for us, you'll have more CAQ. Uh, and finally, for Eric Duhem, the conservative, for those who don't know, he's a, a populist right-wing party, a libertarian, but um, not all the time. Sometimes, you know, he would... Uh, he's libertarian like when he, want, when he wants to. Uh, very popular in Quebec City, a shock radio host. Uh, in the nightmare scenario for the CEQ, where the CEQ stumbles, Eric Duhem would probably win a, a handful or more than a handful of seats in the Quebec City area. So uh, that's a lot of ifs, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So you see it primarily that the opposition parties would have to be doing a lot better. You don't see the CEQ itself. You know what I mean? Like, what are the, could the CEQ lose this on their own? It's very hard. As you know, in the numbers, you don't look just at the voting intentions. You look at the satisfaction number. You look, you look at the favorite premier candidate. 
Uh, and François Legault is far and away the only candidate that is uh, seen as a potential premier. The others get uh, you know, below 10% in most polls. And so unless there's a huge surprise, like a Jack Layton surprise during the election, but you know, this 2011, we talked about this many times, 2011 at the federal level feels more like an outlier than a, a mm -hmm. path or a hope going forward for many parties. But uh, I do not see circumstances where the campaign goes so badly that they lose this uh, this lead because ne uh, no uh, opposition party leader is popular. So that's the thing. There's nobody to pick up the, 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 the I mean, CAQ voters are not just, you know, strong CAQ voters disappointed with the campaign would not just turn to Dominique Anglade and the Liberals. I mean, it's very few of them would actually do that. Perhaps the Parti Québécois, but the, 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 you know, the step is so high. I mean, the Parti Québécois is in single digits right now. So even if they double their, their, their vote, which is unlikely, but if they did at 17, 19%, they would win a dozen seats. That's really not enough to put a dent in the CAQ armor. Yeah. Okay. Well, you mentioned the conservatives. Uh, that's one of the parties that is a new opponent for the CAQ. They didn't have to worry about them last time. And it's a different kind of conversation, right? It's not about fighting over uh, <clears throat> nationalism exactly. It's more of the economic or the the freedom, you know, libertarian kind of positions that the CEQ um, has to defend itself against. It's a different kind of conversation for Francois Legault than what he would be norm what he's normally used to and what we're used to seeing in Quebec elections. So you know, the Conservatives have been rising in the polls. Um, you know, they seem to have stalled somewhere in the mid-teens. Uh, right. In Quebec City, they can do pretty well, usually, you know, over 20%. Do you, do you think that they actually have a good shot of winning seats, or, or <laughs> are they just going to finish second in a lot of places? Well, here's the thing. Uh, that's a very good question, Eric. Right now, and I'm poll after poll that we've seen since uh, the, I don't forget, the fifth wave, the one that was around Christmas and New Year's. This is where we saw a big shift in the polls where the conservatives went to from four or five percent to 15. And it was mostly at the expense of the CAQ, a little bit at the expense of the Parti Québécois. And th those voters uh, are really angry at the government, mostly because of the sanitary measures, the restrictions that we had during COVID. It's not the only issue, but this was the main one that propelled them to um, to that those to, to those numbers. Um, does he have the organization that the CAQ has? The answer, of course, is no. The CAQ has a very well-oiled machine, which is in the conservatives don't. But the conservatives do have a lot of members. Uh, they have more members than any party now in Quebec. Does that speak to uh, a huge movement in the, in, in, in the crowd? Perhaps, perhaps not. Um, but uh, the numbers that we had over many polls show that the conservatives are second basically everywhere in Quebec City. Uh, ex except the, the downtown core, of course. So in the in the suburbs, Les Couronnes de, de Quebec, uh, they would be second. And this is kind of a, the, the down the downside for Eric Durham because he would need its split vote. If the Parti Québécois and the Liberals were a bit higher in the polls, it would help him because right now he's only facing the CEQ in Quebec City, where the CEQ did really well in 2018. And so, you know, 40% in a writing might not be enough to win it. He, he probably win, it needs 45% or 50% to win. Uh, the, the leader, Eric Duhem, is in the Chauveau, which is just the northern part of Quebec City. A part of it is the suburbs, and part of it is a, is a rural area towards Saguenay Saint Jean. Uh, it's a really good writing for him. The CAQ candidate, uh, the CAQ MNA, sorry, uh, is not really popular. He's a low profile guy. So he has a chance. But still, I mean, you can't bank on a split vote. So uh, the CAQ will do everything to protect their right flank. Uh, does, do they have a realistic chance? They have a chance. It's just, it's also very plausible that Eric Duhem has 10 or 12 second places in Quebec City. Do you think the party has a ceiling that's pretty low? Because we oh, yeah. did see a big rise in support, but then, then the yeah. trend stopped. They, they, they popped Duhem. out at about 20% yeah. and then dropped down a little bit from there. Eric Zouem's past as a radio host and radio commentator, uh, I mean, he was really popular, but it, it's also really toxic for a, a section of, of, uh, of Quebec voters. And uh, no party really, including the CAQ, they have not really paid attention much to Zouem because I think they, they didn't want to wake up the beast. Uh, every time they talk about Zouem, Zouem says, look, they, we're dangerous, they're talking about us. Uh, this old uh, strategy, right? 
but I think I would not be surprised, Eric, uh, if during the campaign, especially early in the campaign, we see many of Eric Zuhem's past quotes <laughs> mm. about Islam, about uh, you know, about women, about about a bunch of issues that he said that perhaps he didn't fully mean it. Perhaps he was just doing a, a shock radio host show. Uh, but still, it could come back to haunt him, and um, perhaps his his followers would not mind what he said because they know him. But perhaps it was it would lower the ceiling for sure. I mean, I really doubt this, the the PCQ could have a wave and win twenty seats, for instance. Uh, they're concentrated in Quebec City and perhaps in Beauce, the Chaudière Appalaches, the south shore of Quebec City. Uh, their ceiling is more the absolute ceiling. I would say is ten seats. Uh, but I, you know, two or three seats would be a, a positive uh, for them. So if it's, you know, the CQ and the Conservatives in Quebec City, Montreal, it's a very different situation. So we'll talk about the Liberals. I do want to talk about the Anglophone vote uh, in a minute. Right. But first, just the support for Dominique Anglade and the Liberals among Francophones has really tanked. Um, yeah. You know, so how much of a problem is this for the Liberals? It's 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 a huge problem because not only for the, 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 the mere numbers of it, that they would lose a bunch of uh, seats if they don't have francophones voting for them but the uh, the outlook it would look really bad if the, the liberals became became uh, the west island party i mean you don't want that if you become a party of anglos francophones will never vote for you again so you want to have a, you know some sort of coalition you want to have some 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 sort of support outside of those communities um, we have to remember also that the liberals there's also there's always un fond like a, there's a, like a layer that we don't see in polls that's always there. I mean, even though the Liberals won two seats uh, north and east of Montreal last election, which they both lost in by election since, um, you know, if you take the 2018 election, the popular vote, remove Montreal, remove Laval, where the Liberals did really well. And then the rest of Quebec, who finishes second to the CAQ? The Liberals. So they have support pretty much everywhere, but it's gone down everywhere. And so the odds of winning seats obviously has gone down, uh, but they have high hopes uh, to regain some support in the Eastern townships and the Utawa region where the CAQ did really well and where the liberals had a terrible turnout. And so uh, the Francophone vote uh, in some polls, it's single digits. In most polls, it's around 10 to 15% in the same waters on the même zoo um, as the PQ in Quebec Solidaire. Uh, they're still projected to be the, op uh, the official opposition because they have the support still of uh, most Anglophone and Allophone voters in Montreal and Laval. Uh, how um, certain can they be of that? Because now we're starting to see there's some movements afoot to have um, you know, Anglophone parties, parties that are uh, focused right. on English language rights. Uh, you know, we saw with the Equality Party back in 1989 that that had an, uh, you know, they were able to win seats, didn't matter. Uh, Robert Bourassa was still able to win the election at that point. But um, is there any risk here for them? Or is this, you know, we often talk about it almost, it seems like in every election when the Liberals aren't doing well, that the Anglophone vote is finally going to abandon them and, and they're going to be in real trouble. Is, is this an actual election where this could happen? Here's the thing, though, and I, I know you know this, I'm not teaching you anything, but the reason there's so much unrest in among uh, liberals and anglophones is because the liberals are not competitive in the election. If they were at 25 or 30 percent, if they could challenge the CAQ either to win or to reduce them to a minority, uh, the anglophones, I think most of them would fall in line. Uh, but right now they're not competitive. They're projected to lose compared to their 2018 result, which was already disastrous. And so losing for them is uh, abnormal. <laughs> the liberals are a power party, right? They, they, uh, they, they, they. So to be so low in the polls and in the projections creates a lot of tension. So those two uh, anglophone parties, uh, the Canadian Party of Quebec, um, I, you know, it's really hard to have an organization uh, five or six months before an election. So they may take a few hundred votes from the liberals, but. I don't see them as a big uh, challenge. The Bloc Montréal, which clin d'œil, wink to the name. I mean, Balarama Holness, who finished third in the mayoral uh, uh, election for Montreal uh, with 7% in the, uh, in the election, he founded the Bloc Montréal, which I think is a great name. Uh, however, again, organization, will they be able to win seats? Probably not. Will they be able to play spoilers 
take a few hundred votes here and there in some writings and perhaps hurt the liberals and help the CEQ, that's plausible. Uh, but then again, they don't have an organization that take, you know, you need resources, you need people, you need uh, volunteers to raise uh, the, the stakes and have votes for you. Uh, they don't have that. And so uh, I'm, I'm willing to wait and see local polls that we'll have during the campaign, but for now, they're still a very minor part. Yeah, and for the CEQ in the last election, uh, if I remember correctly, the polls at the end of the campaign sometimes had the CEQ sometimes at 15, 20% among Anglophones. Um, but because of the laws, uh, Bill 296 that they brought in, it, that support seems to have gone away. So it, it does maybe help things for the Liberals a little bit in those writings where it's more of a split population where there's Anglophone and Francophones because the CEQ is not really very competitive now among uh, Anglophone voters anymore. I mean, in 2012, the first election of the CEQ, which was the student unrest election, the Montreal Gazette endorsed <laughs> François Legault. You know, that's, that's how far we've been. And the, the CEQ became even more nationalistic. They decided to basically eat up whatever's left of the Parti Québécois. And of course, that costs you those potential Anglophone uh, so voters and support. Uh, but, you know, seat-wise, it's, it's a win for the CEQ. I, I'm not judging the, the merits or... Uh, of the, the laws that they pass, that's not what I do. Uh, but it, it, from a pure strategy point of view, it was really smart. I mean, the votes out there that would push the CAQ towards a historic majority, they're mostly at the PQ. If you, you know, convince former PQ or disappointed PQ voters to go into your fold, this is how you win 100 seats. Um, let's talk about uh, sticking to Montreal, Quebec City there. Um, you know, they made a bit of a breakthrough last time. They won 10 seats. Um, right. you know, they've had pro progression in every election, right? They either increased their seat share or their vote share. Um, does it feel like this could be the election where that stops? As of today, Eric, the answer is yes. However, uh, you know, if you, if you take a second to look at the big picture, the Parti Québécois and the Liberals are both significantly down compared to 2018, whereas Quebec solidaire is, has not moved much. So not losing ground during the, that four-year period could be seen as a positive because your opponents did go down. Um, but again, where is Quebec solidaire going to win? They, they won 10 seats the last election. They were competitive in 11 seats. Uh, so they almost, they won everywhere where they could, basically. Right. And right now in Montreal, their numbers have not improved. Uh, perhaps their, 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 their get out the vote machine has improved, but the CAQ's numbers are high, especially because Parti Québécois voters, uh, many of them are going to the CAQ. They're not going to Quebec Solidaire for the most part. So uh, the seats where they plan to be competitive as a game, uh, we're talking about Verdun, uh, Maurice Richard, potentially, that's the northern part of Montreal. Uh, Quebec said that did well in those writings, but the CEQ is projected to do even better. So they might be collecting, like Eric Duhem and the Conservatives, many second places uh, finish. Um, right now, they have a few seats of their own, Quebec Solidaire, who are in danger, that are in danger of losing. Rouen Aranda Témiscamingue, which you called it four years ago, I remember, but she won with 32% of the votes. So you need a split vote for her to win unless, you know, some, right now something's happening. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a, 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 a fonderie, I'm not sure what you call it, English, I'm sorry, but an industry there that's very polluting the water and the air. Uh, and the CEQ seems to have this not under control. And so the, the local m &A could perhaps uh, benefit from this crisis. You know, it's, it's terrible, but, you know, the opposition here is uh, banging a drum on this issue. Uh, so it could help her. But in Quebec City, you have Jean Lesage. Again, it was a split vote for Suz and it's seen in Jean Lesage. It could be really difficult. And then you go back to Montreal. Sherbrooke should be fine. You go back to Montreal. Some of those seats were won. Rosemont was a close race. And so. Will you be able to repeat those 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 seats? Perhaps, but it, it's not a sure thing. You see, though, as, as, as of gains, also, I mean, I'm sorry, but I yeah. forgot. Uh, the Quebec State Diet has high hopes for Rimouski and mm. uh, some places in the Gaspésie. It, it's which is interesting. They could get a high a good score, like twenty percent, but that's really not enough to win. Uh, so uh, I don't see where they could win additional seats uh, realistically. But at least, you know, they could look at the PQ and the Liberals say, hey, we, we didn't go down as much as that. If, if they do end up in a lot of second places, though, 
Uh, could this be a stepping stone kind of election where the last one they became kind of a legitimate party that's contending this this yep. time they could replace the PQ in a lot of places and maybe even the liberals in a few places and then in the next election in in 2026 okay. um, maybe Quebec City there is is suddenly a vying for for government uh, well ugh. seems like a lot <laughs> I would say they, they could realistically they could probably hope to be the official opposition, which would be mm. great for them. Uh, but the, the, Gabriel Dubois and his team are trying to transform Quebec Solidaire into more of a like, typical provincial NDP party, mm -hmm. uh, which a uh, left of center party, a uh, Labour party. Uh, that's what they're trying to do, I think, uh, and it could work. But it, that takes a lot of time, especially when your party became. When, when Quebec Solidaire won seats 10 years ago, I mean, it was reasonably the most left-wing party that has representation in all of North America. It was mm -hmm. really radical. I don't think it's as radical as it was 10 years ago. They're trying to go more mainstream, which I think is the, the way to go if you want to grow. Uh, but there's still, there's still a huge wall to climb over there because to win government, you have to win in the suburbs, you have to win in the rural regions. And you know they have they have Wernanda and that's that's it. Sherbrooke is not a is not a rural region, um, so it could be a stepping stone towards perhaps being a second party, especially if the Liberals stumble and become uh, the the Anglo party. That's possible. Uh, you know, um, we'll All have right. to wait and see. Well, okay, we'll talk about it in twenty thirty. Um, okay, so <laughs> sure, <laughs> we'll finish with the Parti Québécois. Um, yeah. So this is, you know, you talked about the Liberals being sort of a natural governing party because it was when it wasn't another party, it was always the Liberals that were governing. You know, the Parti right. Québécois has been a party that has marked uh, the history of the province for the last uh, quarter, uh, half century. Right. But now it looks like they could be on the verge of extinction. You have them in, um, you know, single digits in some polls. A, a good poll has them at 12 percent. And <laughs> Even when you see the regional breakdowns, it's hard to see where they have any concentration of support. I know they have some support in, in you know, the Basse de and the Gaspésie, um, but even there, some of those seats were really close last time. Yeah, so just a were. tiny drop is going to hurt them. So I don't know what, how, how bad of an election could this be for the Parti Québécois, or because it's a campaign, could some support go back to them that you know has been parked with other parties because no one's been talking about the PQ for the last four years. Here's the thing. I remember 2014, that terrible election for Pauline Marois. The PQ had 25% of the popular vote. And many people said, well, that's the floor. That has to be the floor. That's, that's terrible. At core, I mean, more people want sovereignty than, the, than they vote for the Parti Québécois. It doesn't make sense. And four years later, they had 17%. When uh, Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon, the new leader of the Parti Québécois, the unelected leader of the Parti Québécois, when he uh, elected in the sense he doesn't have a seat. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, he didn't run in the by election in uh, Barry Bucarin. So uh, when he took the reins of the party, uh, PQ was polling at 14, 15, 16%, and now in that nine, 9%. So, <laughs> I mean, could they have a great campaign focused on independence, trying to take those voters who are frustrated with the, the Trudeau government at, uh, in Ottawa uh, and, and bring back people into their fold? It's possible. It's just that they've been doing that for quite a while and doesn't seem to work. And Paul saint pierre I mean, he's going to play his political career in the debates, uh, but it's going to be a debate with five leaders. So mm. Rick Duhem should be at the debate, both TVA and Radio-Canada. I believe they said if he stays above 10%, he will be in the debates. And it looks like he's going to be there. So it's going to be really hard for Paul saint pierre to distinguish himself from this crowd. But it, it's possible. It's just that... I do not see the Parti Québécois going any lower than this, but we've said this before. So uh, if the PQ gets 10% of the popular vote, unless there's a big micro local shift that we do not see, they're going to win a single seat. And that's uh, Pascal Berube and Matapédia, a very popular local MNA. That's down the St. Lawrence. They should be competitive, as you said, in the Gaspésie region, Gaspé, Les Îles de la Madeleine. That's always a hard one to call because lower turnout and lower population, obviously. Uh, but, I mean, they used to dominate the, the suburbs of Montreal. Now they have none, and they're projecting to win none. They used to win in Laval. They have none there. 
Uh, they did well in the, the Mauricy region around Trois-Rivières in 2012, that's 10 years ago. Uh, they're not winning a single seat in that region. So it, at, at best, four or five seats, most of them would be surprises. At worst, a single seat if uh, Pascal Berube, uh, I mean, he says he's gonna, he's gonna be running. It looks like he's running. Uh, perhaps if, he, <laughs> if he's ready to be alone in the National Assembly, because he did say very publicly that he doesn't want to be a PQ leader. But if he's the only MNA, perhaps the pressure will, uh, will increase. Uh, but yeah, so the Parti Québec right now, I, you know, the nightmare scenario, I said the nightmare scenario for each party, right now the nightmare is now. Uh, mm. that, that result would be nightmarish. I do not see them going any lower. Uh, perhaps if the CAQ stumbles, they could win back some of those lower St. Lawrence and guest busy seats, but that's still a handful of seats at yeah. most. And when you talk about, you know, the PQ running a campaign that could be uh, predicated on independence and grievance with, you know, the federal government, that kind of thing. Uh, in a different campaign, it feels like, you know, that is the playbook of the Belsley Québec web, but with François Legault and the CAQ, they are already occupying the space of uh, protecting Quebec from the federal government, right? So it really blunts the PQ's message because the PQ's option is far more, um, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's going much further than what the CAQ and François Legault uh, are doing with their more autonomous kind of approach, which seems to be where Quebecers are pretty comfortable right now. So if it was between, if the Liberals were the ones who were vying for power, then, you know, the PQ saying, you know, independence, we've got to go that way might be more Absolutely. successful, but the CEQ just is this is the, the safer option if you're upset with Ottawa. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about this. And I wrote the, uh, my last column for Politico uh, touched into this. I mean, it was almost, it was uncomfortable watching so many PQ supporters and MNAs uh, just mocking the CAQ MNAs waving the Canadian flag on, mm. uh, on July 1st. I mean, just the fact that they would tweet Happy Canada Day en français, uh, the people say, look, that, that, that's a proof that they're federalists and they're not sovereignists. And so it, it, this gets a lot of tweets, uh, retweets and likes among their supporters. There's no empirical proof that, you know, they, that improves your, uh, your image and your own, uh, in, that you bring new people to the fold. And the Parti Québécois needs to bring new people into the fold. They're regularly polling last among the young demographic. I know the young dem younger voters usually vote less, but it's, it would be um, abnormal for young voters who are not sovereignists to, you know, be in the middle of their life at 40 years old and say, you know what, I want to vote yes in the referendum. Now that, that, is unlikely to happen. So uh, it, it, as you said, it's the traditional playbook for the Parti Québécois. It's pretty much all they have left, right? Uh, Quebec solidaire is occupying the left. Um, the CAQ is occupying whatever, the, you know, the, the identity nationalistic file, yeah. identity. Uh, so, hey, the PQ and the Liberals needed each other for that long. And right now it looks like they don't have any muscle memory how, on how to campaign on everything and anything else. So, uh, it, I'm, you know, I'm very curious to see what ha will, will happen. Pascal Berube probably will save the Parti Québécois from being wiped out because he will probably win. Matam Matepedia would be shocked if he if he loses. He had, I think, he had seventy percent of the vote uh, in this in this riding. So he's the king of Hatan. He should stay there. Yeah, his margin of victory. I think there was only a few West Island results that That's were right. greater. So uh, that That's just right. shows you how how safe he is there. But um, if he is the lone man standing when it's all done, it's hard to imagine that he sticks around for a full term. And if he does, that he runs again after that. So um, yeah. yeah, it could be could be rough for the Pelsi Québécois in terms of this election. That's why I think this election is a lot more interesting than people might be giving it credit for. They see the that Ontario in the polls. That Ontario for sure. <laughs> well, that's a low bar. But <clears throat> when you you know you see these polls that have the CQ way ahead, it seems like it's not going to be very competitive. But there's going to be so much at stake for the other parties. That's right. Even if the CEQ wins another majority government, uh, they're all vying for the future and their survival oh, yeah. in some cases for the Liberals and the Parti Québécois for being a party in the future that can actually vie for uh, you know a greater role for the Conservatives in Quebec City there. So there's lots still to watch here. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't agree more, Eric. There's a lot of storylines that are very important for next or the future elections. I mean, again, we, we talked about we talked like the CAQ has already won. It's just that we've never seen a party lose that big of a, a lead in so short a time in, in Quebec or any other province, I believe, unless you can 
you know, you, you know your elections. I read your uh, every election uh, blog, which is really good. Uh, it, uh, has a party lost 25 points in, a, in, in three months? I, you know, not that, that, none that come to mind for sure, but uh, that's what would have to happen. That's why we talk about the inevitability that, of the CEQ win. Uh, but again, many storylines. And if Eric Duhem does win a couple of seats, then suddenly you have a real uh, um, un, um, uh, unafraid right of center party in mm. Quebec, which we haven't seen in quite a while. I mean, the, the Charest liberals were, of course, right of center uh, fiscally and economically, but not very different uh, crowd than what Eric is attracting. So uh, very diverse political spectrum in Quebec, which I think will make it, this one very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, going back to the 1970s, or maybe I was just reading a book on Real Cahouette and the yeah. Réalement des Crédisistes. Uh, absolutely. A little bit yeah. of a, you know, it, it's certainly different, different parties, different uh, characters, yeah. but uh, some things, uh, you know, come around. They, they, it's a circle history. Anyway, so we'll have lots to talk about for the next couple of months, and I'm sure uh, you're going to be very busy, but hopefully you'll make a little bit of time for us when we can chat again, because uh, there's 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 going to be some stories. That, there's going to be some stories here. I always have time for you, Eric. It's always a pleasure to speak with you uh, in politics. And, you know, as I said, we did uh, what, two, two podcasts together about Ontario, and Ontario was a snooze fest. I think this one will be, uh, will be interesting. And you know what? The CEQ, if they stumble and they go back to their level of 2018, some of those will, I mean, many people will ask questions. And then suddenly 2026 comes to mind. Uh, so, you know, it, or if they win 100 seats, well, suddenly <laughs> you have a lot of newly demonies that are expected to be in cabinet and they won't be. Uh, so inter internal stripes could be a story. I don't know. It's never a boring day in Quebec politics. No, never at all. So thanks so much, <laughs> Philippe, and uh, looking forward to talking to you again. À bientôt, Eric. Merci beaucoup. Thanks to Philippe for that conversation. You can check out his work at 338canada.com. He also writes for Politico Canada and L'Actualité. You'll hear a lot from him, I'm sure, between now and Election Day in Quebec. So if you like this video, I hope that you'll subscribe to this YouTube channel and share it with others. And I'll see you next week.